Of course, we all know about the prosperity gospel. It's the teaching that God wants us all to be wealthy. The mysteries of the kingdom of God. The mystery of the hundredfold the mysteries of divine health. It is the will of God for you to be promoted, yeah. to be advanced. Yes. God wants to exalt you and lift you up. So we know the plan of Jesus was to come and give you an abundant life. Empowered to prosper. There you start with prosperity in the Bible. Right there. And all you have to do to get wealthy is give these pastors your money. If you've got, oh, I've only got $10. Well, you're going to tithe one of them to the Lord. That's it. Money, please. You sowing seed in the spiritual realm? You sowing seed in the physical realm? You sowing seed in the financial realm? Money, please. Money, please. First portion of all things. So all first belong to God. The first hours of your day, the first day of the week, the first tenth of your income that becomes a tithe, the first income of the year, the first month, all of first, your firstborn. And of course, it's just a giant scam. He said, I want you to believe me for a Falcon 7X. So I said, okay. Are you seeing this? I hope so, you bought it. <laughs> and to be fair, a lot of Christians do not like the prosperity gospel at all. So it's, it's a distortion of the gospel. Jesus did not die to make us materially wealthy. Mm. He died to make us right with God. The greatest need man has now here's the deal. Um, I hate the prosperity gospel. I hate it. I think Kenneth Copeland is a demon-possessed freak, and I think he's going straight to hell when he dies. Pagan pantheistic perspective that has been turned into a spiritual Ponzi scheme, making the people at the top of the food chain rich, preying on the desires, the material worldly desires of the people who want all this stuff comes under the name the Word Faith Movement, Prosperity Gospel, name it and claim it. But as much as they say they hate the prosperity gospel, a lot of them still really love rich people and have a real disdain for people who struggle financially. Hey everybody, it has been a minute. I was feeling a little stressed out and a little out of my noggin so I went on a vacation and I got some sun and I cleared my head and it was uh, a really good break that I think I needed. I hope I didn't keep any of you hanging too long uh, but either way thank you so much for being here and returning and uh, thank you so much for subscribing and liking and commenting and whatever else you want to do. I'm not forcing you. Do what you want but I appreciate it. I love it. Thanks. So in the Bible, there are a few passages where Jesus talks about giving away your money, possibly because he saw money as an obstacle to true happiness or to true salvation, or maybe because he was the first century's version of Kenneth Copeland and this was just part of his con. I'm a big fan of money. I like it. I use it. I have a little. I keep it in a jar on top of my refrigerator. I'd like to put more in that jar. That's where you come in. Either way. One of the most famous examples of this is when a rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what must I do to enter the kingdom of heaven? After talking about the law and the commandments for a bit, Jesus tells him to sell his possessions and give it to the poor. Then the guy got upset and left, and Jesus said the famous phrase. I have a saying. Oh, it goes like this. You're going to love this. Shut up. It's easier for a camel to pass mm -hmm. through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So now, for the last 2,000 years, people have been trying to tell us that it doesn't really mean what we think it means. Is this command Jesus gave the man to sell everything, is that a command for all Christians, or was it just a command for the one man? That's a significant question we need to ask, and it'll change how we understand the passage. If you, if you say it's universal, then effectively every Christian has to sell all they have, give it to the poor, in order to follow Christ. But I think that we have every reason to think that's not the case. I mean, let me, and let me say this first. If you're a Christian, you should be willing to do that. Like that should be like, absolutely, Lord, I'll do whatever you want. No questions asked. You want me to sell all I have? I'm going to sell it all right now uh, and give it away. Whatever you want. That should, that's not the issue here. It's not as though I'm like, I have to fight so we can keep our stuff. But rather, I want to understand scripture and the call of Christ to each of us individually. 
So even though we view promises given to Old Testament prophets as a promise from God to us specifically that we will prosper and have hope and a future, this passage here is simply directed to that one person, and we shouldn't worry about following it. Well, I got a saying too. It's easy, you know, why don't you pass your own, pass your ass through the needle? Man, f you, man. Now, the average Christian today <clears throat> who has very little discernment We'll look at that passage and say, there it is, there it is. If you have riches, you're going to hell. That is not true at all, because if that's true, if that, if that statement is correct, then Abraham went to hell, Joseph went to hell, I believe Moses went to hell. Okay, that's just not so. There's, there, this is not what that means. This passage of Scripture is dealing with the covetousness that was in the heart of this man. He loved money, which the love of money is the root of all evil. And one of the Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not covet. And this man was a covetous man who was not willing to walk away from his money to receive Jesus. Now, if you compare this man with Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He said, Lord, all the things I've done wrong, I'll pay it back fourfold. Please just come in my house. You know what the Lord did? He didn't do anything. He didn't make him pay that back. No, he didn't because Zacchaeus already volunteered to give it back. Jesus also didn't stop him from doing it. Also, though, just because it's going to bother me this whole video, what is happening with this guy's background? Is that, is that God looking down on us? Is God a woman? I had a pastor who said that the eye of the needle was a type of gate in Jerusalem that was difficult but not impossible for camels to get through. This, of course, was not a thing that ever existed, but was made up later, possibly by Thomas Aquinas, to justify the wealthy Christians that the church relied on. There have been holes in walls in Jerusalem that have since been pointed to as being an eye of the needle gate, but that's just fitting something into a narrative instead of being something that caused this narrative. Oh, John, these door frames. It's like trying to force oneself through the eye of a needle. <sighs> but either way, these people want to come to the defense of the rich. Nothing wrong with having money. Not, nothing wrong if God prospers you with having a lot of money. Look, some have a little bit, some have a whole lot, and then there are all the rest of us in the middle somewhere. But that is all determined by the providences of God through circumstances and His plan and His purpose and your gifts and your opportunities and the things that you can control and sometimes the things that you can't control that all converge in His purpose for a believer to make you able to, to get wealth, to put it in the language of Deuteronomy 8. So money is a provision from the Lord. You have the right to possess money. Nothing in the Bible looks down on that. Job, very wealthy. Abraham, very wealthy. There are wealthy people in the New Testament. Joseph of Arimathea, he was a wealthy man who provided a grave for Jesus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's no issue there. The Lord has provided wealth for us at all different levels. Is it okay to be wealthy as a Christian? Of course it is. There are a lot of examples in the Bible where God blessed people financially. Look at Abraham, Jacob, David, Solomon, Job, Joseph, the Roman centurion, Lydia, Barnabas, Matthew, and Philemon. So it is not a sin to be rich, as some might claim. No, especially if you've worked hard for your money, because we know that the Bible says that you will reap what you sow. So if you put a lot of work in, you will earn your reward. Yeah, someone's been listening to outdated boomer financial advice, but we'll get back to that in a minute. I want you to notice this. It doesn't say that it's wrong for these men to have riches, but it is wrong for Christian men to let riches have you. And there is a difference. If you're it like like, for example, if you're missing church and you ain't been in church for three months because you want to try to make money, I would say that riches have you. You don't have riches. Isn't that really the most evil thing you can think of that rich people do for money? Not taking Sundays off? Then we looked at the difference between abundance and prosperity. From a biblical perspective, abundance is a blessing and poverty is a curse. You don't have to avoid your resources. There's been a mistaken notion that's flourished in Christianity that somehow poverty was a, a holier place. Not true. You can have nothing and be filled with greed and envy and covetousness. Most of us have had a little walk through that valley. 
But if you own a corporation that hoards up all the housing so that they can jack up rent, or you're a grocery store CEO who makes record profits while working together with other grocery stores to increase food costs, then you're just a smart businessman, and we don't get to criticize you. But yeah, it's the envy of the people who are struggling. That's the problem. Another deception that's very common today is that some people have too much money. Who appointed you to make that decision? That's deception. That is deception. Why is it okay for one person to have hundreds of billions of dollars while there are children starving? Like, maybe you can make an argument that it's okay to be wealthy, but I think it's impossible to say that nobody has too much money. $465 billion, that's how much richer Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and the world's richest men got in the last four years, according to a new report from the UK-based charity organization Oxfam. That amounts to $14 million per hour. Oxfam says, on the other hand, nearly 5 billion people are poorer than they were four years ago. At least 1.7 billion workers across the world saw inflation rise at a rate higher than their wages. In the last 10 years, more than half of the new wealth created globally has gone to the richest 1% of humanity. And no, you shouldn't, because again, that goes back to this wealth is evil message. Mm -hmm. Wealth's not evil. Wealth doesn't have morals. It's not good. It's not bad. What you do with it is what counts. Okay, so say we're all enjoying a meal together, and I start walking around, and I start taking all the food off everybody's plate, and then I start putting it in a safe. And I won't let anyone near the safe, and I won't let anyone eat. And someone said, hey, stop taking all our food. We're hungry, and you took it from us. What you are doing is very evil. Would then the correct response be, oh, so you're saying food is evil? If it's so evil, why should I give it back to you? Do you also want to be evil? No, obviously not. It is the hoarding of the wealth that is evil. No billionaire ever has gotten a billion dollars on their own. There are always people they step on on the way there. Elon Musk, for example, got to start by being born into a rich family who made their money by exploiting workers in emerald mines. And he never stopped exploiting and manipulating people from there. And SpaceX has fired, reportedly, employees who helped to write and distribute an open letter criticizing CEO Elon Musk's behavior. According to these reports, the spacecraft engineering company's president, Gwyn Shotwell, uh, sent an email in which she said that the firm had investigated and terminated a number of employees involved with that land. And there was no email or anything that went out to the to, to the employee saying that like they were moving it up. It would literally just come in on Wednesday and, oh, we're doing the performance acceleration and everyone's getting shit canned. Yeah, I joined the union because I, I saw the direction that, like, the, you know, the company was headed. Like, it was getting very, very militant and very, like, strict. Like, one of the appeals of working for Tesla was that, like, you weren't micromanaged. But now it's like, if you are away from your desk or you're not doing work for, like, five minutes and it shows up in the tracker then you're called into question and it's just like i i was in the bathroom like i i'm having some like stomach troubles or something he used a bunch of government loans to fund building the first teslas and used government ppp loans that were eventually forgiven during covid but still barely pays taxes most years and complains loudly online when he does have to look at jeff bezos making money off the backs of his employees who have some of the worst working conditions imaginable while working hard to squash any attempt at unionizing. The Ministry of Labor is also now investigating after an Amazon employee died at a fulfillment center last weekend. Now, the incident happened after the company's fire alarm went off, sending staff out of the building into the cold weather. California's Department of Occupational Safety and Health confirmed today that it is investigating an employee death. The agency, more commonly known as Cal OSHA, says it was notified that an employee went to the hospital on December 14th after vomiting blood. The employee Where an Amazon facility is closed after an employee death. An Amazon spokesperson confirmed the death to News 8. Uh, the spokesperson says we're saddened by today's tragic incident and our thoughts and prayers are with our employees, loved ones, and our team at the facility. We're conducting a thorough investigation. 
The Amazon Fulfillment Center in North Las Vegas was shut down for most of the day Monday after an employee was found dead inside the building. Still not clear how the employee died, but everyone was sent home with pay after the incident. And first tonight, OSHA is investigating the deaths of three Amazon workers. All died while on the job at three separate New Jersey facilities in the last few weeks. And that's brought about questions of safety at these massive facilities. It pushes you down and takes your food and your money. You're not jealous of their wealth. You're angry that they took it from you. When employees at Walmart have to organize a food drive so that they can eat, but the CEO is making $34 million a year, that CEO is stealing from those employees. Just because something is legal theft doesn't mean it is not theft, doesn't mean it is not immoral, and doesn't mean we shouldn't call them out. Another deception is that wealthy people did something inappropriate to accumulate their wealth. Really. As if poor people didn't do something inappropriate to accumulate whatever they have. Oh, excuse me? That is a hot take, sir. If you don't have money, it's your fault. Am I saying there aren't people who are really bad with money? Or there aren't people who really struggle the whole day on a job? Nope. But guess what? I have this crazy notion that eating food and having a roof over your head is a human right. That everyone deserves dignity, safety, and a full belly regardless of their abilities. But the fact is there are many, many people who work very hard who don't get enough to survive. Plus the fact that there are many qualified people who have been rejected for employment based on many factors outside their own control. Factors like their name doesn't sound white enough for the employer. Thank you for your interest in careers at Mentality Health. Unfortunately, we do not consider candidates that have a suggestive ghetto names. We wish you the best in your career search regards. Dornisha Zachary couldn't believe her eyes when she opened up the email from a recent job application. I mean, yeah, it was very frustrating. He applied for over 100 jobs unsuccessfully until... My full name is about 21 letters in total. I just kind of like shortened it down to about eight letters. Within a couple of weeks, um, I was getting callbacks uh, for like roles I, I desired. So yeah, I guess it worked cited studies was where the researchers sent out a whole bunch of resumes, for example, and they sent out one set of resumes that had more typically white sounding names, and then they had another set of resumes that had more black sounding names. Those folks have to send out 50% more resumes in order to get the same result as somebody who has a David or a John or a Stacey or what have you. So no, no, it's not always your fault. Now the, the challenge with that is this notion of wealth is relative. I interact with lots and lots of people and I very seldom meet somebody that says, oh no, I'm rich. Because no matter how much, how many resources you've accumulated, you know, someone has accumulated more and it seems a little awkward to say, oh, I'm rich. So it's, it's such a relative discussion. We need a little perspective. There's about 8 billion people in the world. Five billion, five of those 8 billion people earn less than $10 per day. I'll go out on a limb and say most of us who are working in here earn significantly more than $10 a day. So we fight for them too. We hold corporations accountable for using nearly slave labor or even straight up slave labor in other countries because we believe that everyone on this planet deserves to get paid for what they do no matter who they are or where they live. We don't say it's fine that I'm struggling because other people struggle more. We say it's wrong what's happening to me and it's also wrong what's happening to them. So from a global standpoint, the one of us with the least is wealthy. So I don't feel wealthy. I didn't ask about your feelings. This really isn't subjective. Well, I know people that have more understood. I see this all the time with religious family members or just family members in general online where they post things like this. Do you want to know how much you are blessed? Your terrible job is the dream job of every unemployed. Your house is the dream of every homeless. Your smile is the dream of the depressed. Your health is the dream of the ill. Your lifestyle is the dream for somebody else. Don't let difficult times make you forget your blessings.
In some ways, yes, be grateful for what you have, and we should put things into perspective at times. But that doesn't mean you just have to take it. That doesn't mean we're just supposed to be okay with the way that we're all being taken advantage of. This doesn't benefit the people who are actually struggling. This benefits the rich. This makes it so that they don't have to pay us a living wage. Two quarters. But you didn't say thank you. Listen, lady. I can leave without screaming, and I can leave without saying a bad word, but there is no way that I am saying thank you. You're welcome. All right, then off you go to spend it on penny whistles and moon pies. Consumed by the privilege of the maximum effort. Do the best you can and let God determine what the reward will be. You have to have that kind of attitude or you'll live with personal discontent disillusionment, you'll never have enough, you'll be a covetous person, you'll lose friends over it, and you'll become an idolater. <laughs> he says with an estimated $14 million net worth and multiple luxury properties. Some of us are, are deceived into thinking that more money would make me happy. If you can't be content where you are, more won't make you more content. Some of us are deceived into thinking that resources can secure my future. You can't accumulate enough resources to secure your future. Our world is caught in a, a tsunami of change. And the future is not exactly apparent. Our security is in God himself. Okay, so yeah, more money might not make you happy. But less stress contributes to happiness. And being able to pay your bills and being comfortable definitely helps in that department. Now, I've had a little and I've had a lot, and a lot's better. That's why God promises us abundance. I'm not coaching you towards poverty, but your bank account's not a validation of your spirituality. And you don't want to imagine the things you accumulate are what insulates you or protects you or commend you to God because everything belongs to God already and he's not impressed no matter what my tally is. What that means is everything you have is actually on loan from God to you. I know you think you made that money, but if you get a bigger revelation, you're gonna recognize actually it's God just sharing his money with you. Everything you have, your gifts, your talents, your personality, your work ethic, your effort, that has all been on loan from God to you. But if that's the case, it means that people who have no money have no money because God didn't want them to have money or God didn't trust them with this money, that God didn't want you to have talents or work ethic. So if you extend that out, that means that God controls the unemployment rate and God gave people their wealth. So wherever you are socioeconomically, it's because God put you there so you deserve to be there. It's a caste system in the religion that also says, blessed are the poor. It's because when I prioritize my life, God's provision has a place to land. If you really remember some of the miracles in the Bible where God did something great for someone, the first step was for their priorities to be ordered. The first step. When the woman needed a miracle from the man of God in the book of 1 Kings, do you remember this story? The prophet said, I know you don't have much left. I know you lack provision in your own eyes right now, but if you will first give me a little cake, and prioritize the purpose of God. If you will sustain God's work in the earth, God will sustain you. If you remember the little boy with the lunch that Jesus had Peter go over, beat him up, take his lunch, pass it out to the crowd, <laughs> creative interpretation. What started with a lunch ended in leftovers, but it was because of the prioritization to bring it first to Jesus and put it in his hands. That's what we do every time we tithe. It's the first 10% of your income. It's setting it aside for God and saying, God, before anything else, you be the foundation of my finances. You be the foundation of my family. You be the foundation of my future. 
I want to build my life on you. I know I said I was staying away from the prosperity gospel, and then I showed Stephen Furtick. The thing is, yes, he is a prosperity gospel preacher, but he's also really good at pretending not to be. This kind of disguised prosperity gospel is becoming more and more popular in more and more evangelical churches. What would they have to gain? I don't hear scrubbing. It's not about showing off private jets, gold teeth, and oversized suits, but it's still the same principles. God will bless you only if you give me money. And these people know that 10% of a million is far greater than 10% of a hundred. So they can't alienate the rich people by criticizing them in any way. Owned, I think I was more concerned about what a man preaches than I am more concerned about what a man owns. That's good, buddy. That's good. I want to say this to you. I'm more concerned about what a man preaches than I am by what a man owns. Amen. Kenneth Copeland's doctrine bothers me more than his airplanes. And Joel Osteen's doctrine bothers me a whole lot more than some pretty pretty car that he owns. I think he owns a, a Bugatti or one of one of those crazy. <laughs> I can't Itali- even spell that. I, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I, I hope that's not a cuss word in a foreign language. <laughs> I think I know what word he meant, and I think someone just showed what kind of videos he watches. <laughs> and, uh, that would be a, that would be horrible. Uh, but uh, when it comes to guys like these, you know, I, I'm I, just as a preacher and as a Christian, I, I'm really kind of. I'm looking at, okay, what's he preaching, not what he owns? Because I know guys that are fundamental Baptists that are multimillionaires, and oh, yeah. they, didn't, they didn't cheat somebody. I mean, I think some Christians have developed the poverty gospel where, oh, i got to be poor if I'm going to be right with God, and if I have, if I have over $30,000 in assets and, and on a financial statement, I must not be right with the Lord, and I don't know how you can drive a car that nice, and there's children dying and starving in the world. Okay, that, that's a poor man's mindset. That's the poverty gospel, and that's not, that's not biblical. That's not biblical. I mean, I definitely don't have 30 k in assets, but I also don't think anyone would consider that to be wealthy. But no, I don't think being comfortable or even being really comfortable is wrong. But way too many people got there in very crooked ways. So I think a little scrutiny is okay. Many of us are just going through life by default instead of by design. We're just following any pattern. It's like if you don't get a vision for your life and if you don't get a vision for your finances, don't be surprised when somebody else will give you one. If you don't lead your life, somebody else will lead your life. If you don't direct your money, your money will direct you. We don't even have an expectation, but let me just tell you, if you claim to have expectation, the foundation of expectation is preparation. If you're not preparing for it, I don't believe you're expecting it. Do not tell me that you want God to do something great in your life if you're not even preparing for the thing you are believing for. This is just God's word. If you can't be faithful with the little, how on earth can God trust you with a lot? Now, nah, but Pastor Rich, I want to be an entrepreneur. Homie, you haven't ever showed up to your job on time once. How are you living today? I want a worldwide ministry. Okay, I would start serving today. But we, we procrastinate. Remember, he is the one that is saying that nothing is because of you and God gave you your work ethic, and now he's complaining about your work ethic. But I understand that it is hard for some people to keep going to a job that is draining the life out of them. And it can be really hard to show up on time to the worst part of your life. And I'm okay with you discouraging someone from having a church job because I think no one should work in churches, especially someone whose goal in life is to have a worldwide ministry. When your job doesn't even pay you enough to pay rent and childcare and your basic phone bill and your basic groceries and your car payment and gas that you need to get to work. It's hard to make today matter when you're more worried about how you're going to make it through the day instead of how you're going to make it big. When the creditor calls so much that you have a slight panic attack whenever the phone rings, not because you borrowed money for a fancy car or a big screen TV, but because you put diapers on your credit card or food for your children on your credit card. This is the classic blame the individual for where they are while ignoring the bigger factors at play. And what is procrastination really doing? Because some of you are like, what does this have to do with my money? Well, procrastination 
is all about borrowing time in the future for the present. I don't know if you ever heard the old expression, time is money. Time is money. And many of us, what we don't realize is that we're borrowing time from the future and we're killing it today. Poverty kills time. Prosperity executes time. Do you see the difference? One is just wasteful. The other one is saying, yo, how can I make today matter? How can I get on point today? How can I walk in the way of prosperity today? It's easy to blame it on procrastination when you're the one who has means. Sure, yeah, you can start working on your dream job or working towards starting that business or going back to school if you aren't already working two jobs, if you aren't already caring for your sick parent or whatever else you're having to deal with in this capitalistic hellscape we find ourselves in. So how would you accumulate? How would you orchestrate your life so that wealth, honor, and life would be yours? They come indirectly. You don't go pursue them. You pursue humility and the fear of the Lord. And that will bring those things to you. I don't believe that. I know. That's why I read it to you. As if everyone without money isn't humbling themselves before the Lord, isn't seeking God, but every rich person is. All we are doing here is saying that poor people deserve to be poor and rich people deserve to be rich. The Bible is against laziness. There's a lot of people who complain because they don't have enough money, but sometimes it's because they are just lazy. If you sow laziness, you will reap poverty, but if you work hard, you will also reap the rewards. You will pluck the fruit of your labor. There is this belief among older generations that the way to have a good life with a two-car garage and a boat on the lake is to work hard. If you work hard, the rewards will come flooding in. And that's just not the way it is anymore. Ugh, I am through with working. Working is for chumps. Son, I'm proud of you. I was twice your age before I figured that out. But the last one here is that in God's economy, work matters. In fact, it's more important than I, I think that the church has understood. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 14 says, We urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle. Encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everybody. In the same sentence which says help the weak, it says to encourage those, warn those who are idle. Tell them not to stay idle. Oh, get a job? Yeah. Just get a job? Why don't I strap on my job helmet and squeeze down into a job cannon and fire off into job land where jobs grow on jobbies? People say, I don't like work. Okay. Go do it anyway. Well, it's not fulfilling to me. I'm sorry, you're confused. That's called vacation. <laughs> Hobbies are fulfilling. Work is the place where you go where you wouldn't go unless somebody paid you. You are an adult, particularly a man. You need to work a full-time job at the very least. Get a job? Were they serious? I didn't realize it at the time, but a little piece of my childhood had slipped away forever. Bart, what are you staring at? Uh, nothing. He didn't say it and neither did I, but at that moment, my dad and I were closer than we Bart! ever... Stop it. Sorry. What this means is two things. There should be no such thing as a universal basic income. Nobody else should pay for you to spend their money. In addition, there should not be a socialistic redistribution of wealth. If certain people go to work and certain people don't want to go to work, then voting for people to take the money from the people that are going to work is called stealing. Between summer jobs and part-time jobs in high school and college, and then the fact that the longest job I ever had was only four years, I have had many different jobs. I was a dishwasher, then a line cook at a diner. I ran a day camp where I'm surprised any of the kids survived. I worked in multiple record stores. I've been a barista and a coffee shop manager. I worked in call centers for tech companies and a garbage company. I worked at a vegan restaurant. I was a youth pastor. I did background work for a few TV shows, like the time I was a Queen's Guard on Rain. So good to let the people see their Will Darnley has shown his strength and virility. <laughs> And that's me on The Expanse. Yes, it was a character choice I made to get paid to lie down all day. 
so you can get paid and be lazy. I've also always been a person who needs to be creating something. So I was able to make time for things like putting on plays or doing stand-up or sketch comedy. My name is Shell, and I'm the founder of two VCRs. That's right, we don't use that stupid digital editing. I just press play on one and record on the other. It's that simple. Here at two v here at two VCRs, we cut out the we don't cut out the middleman. We the middleman we're the end man. That or this sort of keep bringing up Canadian Idol. No, please, please do. Okay. My God, by all means. When you were on Canadian Idol, <laughs> mm -hmm. did you ever did you ever talk to the producers of the show, or was it more like? Yeah, we okay. talked to the producers. Did you ever explain to them that idol worship is a sin? And it's in the Ten Commandments that it's a sin? Um, That's from God. But I was also single and childless and okay with living with a bunch of dudes to keep costs down. But a lot of people don't get that opportunity. And a lot of people are probably way funnier or way more creative than I am. You see, there's this thing where if you pick a really famous actor or a really famous musician and you look them up on Wikipedia, a large percentage of them have very wealthy parents or very famous parents. Does that mean they aren't talented? No, not necessarily. Nepo truce? Nepo truce. A, a foot in the door, door and so much more. more. Oh, oh. But it means they had more disposable time. They didn't need to work a bunch of jobs just to stay alive. They had the time to work on their craft. And it's not just the arts. You see this with tech startups, with entrepreneurs. This is a very common thing. But it can't just be that the most talented people are the same people who happen to come from money. If we had something like universal basic income, it would free people up to actually create. Think about all the innovation we're losing because people just have to fight to survive and they don't have time to innovate, and they don't have time to create. What arts are we missing out on? What inventions are we missing out on? Because we are convinced that we have to work ourselves to death. Are we really this afraid of a society with more innovation? But so many rich people hate the accusation that they got anywhere based on anything but their own hard work and their own raw talent. And they really think that any effort to level the playing field is stealing. And so if rich people don't like something, then so many pastors also don't like it. If you are rich, God says you've been blessed. Now you're gonna be held responsible for it. Make sure you take care of people that don't have it. If you are poor, God said they'll always be with you. Your job is to try to get yourself out of this thing, but do not covet what others have. Your responsibility is to be okay where you're at and see if you, God will bring you from that place. There is no class system. You don't get to steal from one to give the other and act like that was equitable. That is called stealing. It was in the freaking Ten Commandments. We forget what it means to be a Christian to our peril. Ooh, dollar store Dennis Leary said frickin'. Ooh, he is edgy. Yeah, it's stealing when we want the rich to pay their fair share. But when someone who isn't rich wants to be paid appropriately for their labor, and when someone who can't afford food wants to eat, that is being covetous. It's that old principle if $100 goes missing from a cash register, then your boss can call the cops and you can spend the night in jail. But if $100 goes missing from your paycheck, they'll look into it and maybe you'll be able to call the labor board. And if you file a complaint, they'll know it's you and you could possibly lose your job. We live in an imbalanced system because the people with money are the people with power. America has rewarded laziness and we've called it welfare. The Bible says... The man that does not work should not eat. I know the liberals hate that verse, but read it and weep. It's God's position. It's God's position. And as the government determines that it must control every aspect of life, to maintain that control, money has to come into the government because the government is the controlling agency in everything, and so the takeover will continue to be great. As it does, it will take money from people who have it to give it back to the people that they feel deserve it even though they don't earn it. 
which is a violation of a biblical principle. As you well know, you don't work, you don't eat. <laughs> they really like picking the Bible verses that cater to their own narrative, don't they? What about all the verses about paying people a fair wage? Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your field are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Do not withhold good from those whom it is due when it is your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back tomorrow and I'll give it to you when you already have it with you. A lot of social assistance programs would cease to exist or pay out a lot less money if these corporations paid their employees a fair wage. If people could afford to work and pay for childcare, or if their work paid for childcare, if you could afford to live on minimum wage, if there didn't need to be a minimum wage because employers worried more about the well-being of their employees than they do about getting their shareholders a new summer home, if we could take time off work to care for our loved ones, then maybe we wouldn't need these programs. Jobs used to pay people with the understanding that they had an entire family to care for, and now one person has trouble surviving working a 60-hour week? It's no wonder people need help. And if that biblical principle were enforced that if you don't work, you don't eat, why aren't they going after trust fund kids who haven't worked a day in their life? And what that is is, well, we need to be generous. Well, then be generous. But don't vote somebody to steal my money and give it away. That's not generosity. That's Judas Iscariot. You're taking money don't belong to you and giving it away. One-seventh of our national economy right now goes to merit-based welfare systems that are creating dependence on our government and perpetual need for charity. And that is not loving. Let me, here, I, I wrote this down. Let me just give you four sentences of my ideas on this. America has to start doing the right thing. We will no longer be the land of opportunity if we don't do the things we need to do to create and stay an opportunity society. That means spend less, address debt, fix welfare problems by making it work for the poor, not against them, by encouraging people to work not to be dependent on government or perpetual charity. Oh yeah, because the rich never get government handouts. Bailing out Wall Street is the only way to save Main Street, so says the president. The house of cards was much bigger beyond started to stretch beyond just what pipelines autos asbestos and even banks government bailouts of corporations and industries happen at every level of government think of the liberals 4.5 billion dollar buyout of the trans mountain pipeline expansion or the 2008 2009 auto company bailouts they cost canadians over three billion dollars in losses and still one auto company that received help announced this week it's closing its plant its gm plant in oshawa ontario affecting about 2500 jobs the government gave out $523 billion, and more than half of that went to five, the top 5% of companies, some of them national chains. So what about the mom and pops? Churches never get help from the government, even while they are still receiving donations from their congregants. Federal government data show that nearly 5,000 religious institutions here in California have accepted more than $608 million in federal SBA Paycheck Protection Program money, commonly known as PPP loans. While experts tell us there's nothing wrong with that, some do question whether it's a contradiction that some of those churches continue to defy local government health orders on the one hand while accepting government money with the other. Through a special exemption, the U.S. Roman Catholic Church received at least 1.4 to more than 3.5 billion in taxpayer-backed coronavirus aid. We dug into what Chicago's archdiocese is getting and found between 150 to 300 thousand dollars to retain 18 jobs. Roman Catholic Diocese of Joliet got between one to two million to secure 126 jobs. The Paycheck Protection Program was designed to help businesses, many small shops, with forgivable loans if used for wages, rent, and utility. When corporations, churches, wealthy people do it, it's just smart business. When someone struggling to keep their family fed does it, they are a leech on society. But it's easier to scapegoat people who are already struggling as being the problem than to call out the ones who are causing the problem. So what do we do? Do we just start feeding people? 
We so often miss the fact that really the material problems that we're seeing associated with poverty are rooted in much deeper relational issues. And the church has enormous relational capital they can bring to bear on that situation. When we think about the fact that poverty in America is so closely related to the breakdown of relationships, particularly the marriage relationship, poverty is very much associated with father absence. And it's also associated with the breakdown of a community, communities that help people network and find a place to use their gifts in work. The absence of fathers, worklessness, these are key drivers of poverty in America. And the church can open up its arms and build relationships, help form a marriage culture, restore that family knit around a child, and be able to help people back into meaningful, purposeful work these are just incredible gifts that the church could bring to bear on the question of poverty in America. We preach about family. Cool, that, that'll help. Starving people can't eat money. Plus, if we give money to poor people, then they won't be poor anymore and we won't have anyone to feel sorry for. Oh, poor people. Yeah. Family matters. That idea has to come back into the heart of the church. It's why we can't surrender to redefining the family because society will unravel. It won't work. It's not about hate. I mean, there's a little bit of hate, right? Like just like a smidgen of hate. There's some in there. Or rejecting people. We understand what's fundamental and foundational. Family brings with it responsibility. And if we, if we avoid our responsibility and imagine someone or something else should avoid it, we step away from God's perspective. Family brings with it responsibility, parental responsibility, children and grandchildren have responsibility as well. Government is not our source. And just in case you're not clear, governments don't have money. They have our money. Yes, I get that there is something to be said about getting to the root of the problem instead of only finding Band-Aid solutions. But you still need that Band-Aid to stop the bleeding. And you still need to do something right now to help people. But also, is this the root of the problem to begin with? Yes, there is a correlation between the number of parents in a family and the income of that family because two incomes are better than one income. But seen as the church has always preached about the family and has still had higher divorce rates than non-religious people, maybe it's time to admit that that approach isn't working, and it's not fixing the problem, and you should just feed people. Maybe it shouldn't be expected that a household needs two full-time incomes to get over the poverty line, and maybe we could go back to a day where a single income was enough. Maybe we should shame corporations for allowing their employees to live in poverty and not shame the people affected by it based on their relationship status. Maybe we should pressure billionaires to pay their share instead of blaming single mothers for needing some assistance. When I was born in 1970, there was less government and government debt because there were more fathers. As we've had less fathers, guess what we have? More debt and more government. And now we are at a place that we have far too few fathers. And as a result, we have far too much government. And those who grow up without a father and only knowing the government think that the answer is more government and the answer is more fathers and less government. I'm really hungry, sir. Do you have any food? Have you considered having a dad? Involved. Somebody suggested question whether or not you can be a witness for Christ we have a lot of money. Calling you a hypocrite, really. You know, there, there, it is. There, there, there's a, a toxic version of the left gotten involved in uh, Christianity as well. And it's this idea that, you know, that Christians can't own anything or can't manage anything. And we technically don't own anything, those of us that are Christ followers. We technically manage it for God and for His glory. But the idea that, that someone can have a nice home that's a small percentage of their net worth and still still do things for the poor right. and still do things for the uh, folks that are struggling and, and still have a quality walk with Christ, it, it's, an, it's an absurdity and it's actually a form of heresy. Yeah, they give to charity. They give to charity to avoid paying taxes that if they actually paid, those charities wouldn't need to exist. At least not the charities that actually do something. A lot of times, the charities aren't really charitable. 
a lot of times these charities are charities that they have created. A charity that pays giant salaries to their family members or even pays themselves a salary out of the money that they donated to that charity. In many cases, the money goes into a DAF or a donor advisor fund that are supposed to decide how the money is split up to charities but have no timeline for actually giving to charity. So they are really just moving money from one place to another and calling it a charitable donation. And again, giving themselves a salary from it. And even if they do donate to a real charity, it's still them deciding who gets their charitable donation and how that money is spent. So it's not necessarily going to help real people who actually need help today. To show my appreciation, I'd like to give the hospital a brand new handcrafted baccarat table etched in 24 karat gold. Wow, Richard, that is very generous, but I wonder if the hospital couldn't use something a little more life-saving-ish? I'm not impressed with your money. Billionaires donating to charity is really billionaires avoiding putting the money they owe to actual use. It means that the taxes they don't pay ends up being paid by everyone else. But people have this mindset that they are just pre-billionaires or pre-millionaires. And once they get there, they don't want the government taking all their money. So they act against their own best interests. Yeah, that'll show those poor. Why are you cheering, Fry? You're not rich. True, but someday I might be rich. And then people like me better watch their step. They pay more in taxes now with less benefits because they have been convinced that the super wealthy shouldn't have to pay anything. And we have pastors who are supposed to be the modern day voice for Jesus, a man who supposedly said, and the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Who said, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Do not lay yourself up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy or where thieves break in and steal, but lay for yourself treasures in heaven for neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. These pastors instead shame those who are in need, call people lazy for asking for help, call them covetous when they want their fair share, tell them to be content with what they have, all while praising the wealthy, praising those who take advantage of their workers. Also that maybe these rich people will come to their church and share a little bit of that wealth with them, that they can get a taste of that lavish lifestyle. This is just another way that we can tell that they are in it for themselves. I gotta figure out how to make money on this thing. It's simply too good. Stand up for yourselves. Stand up for others. Stop licking the boots of rich people. Fight back. Hey everybody, thank you so much for making it this far. If you know somebody who may benefit from watching it, send it their way. You're all awesome. You're all the best. I love you all so much. Work, 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 Sky Moon. <laughs>